This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan, and it is an absolute privilege to gather here to talk about some of the most important issues of our day, to try to glean some perspective with some of the most thoughtful, virtuous contributors in their respective fields and regular guys like me. And we come together in goodwill and good faith. It is an honor for TPNR to be a part of the Democracy Group, a network of podcasts that examines what's broken in our democracy and how we can work together to fix it. And before we start, I have a huge favor to ask, you know, to follow or subscribe, of course. But if you haven't given us a rating, hopefully five stars and written a review, would you do that? It really does help us. And if you have done it already, go to one of the other podcast apps and do it again. We're starting to get a lot of downloads, which is awesome. But the one thing we really need is to get more reviews. That's the way we get ranked and noticed by the big app, uh, the big podcast apps like Apple, Spotify, and others. And it all helps get the word out so more people can participate in these conversations, like the important one we're having today with Will Salatan. Some folks might remember Will Salatan or are familiar with him for his work at The Bulwark, and he's been on this program before. Will Salatan wrote for Slate for 25 years, having written over 2,700 pieces for the Daily Online Magazine. Incredible. He is also the author of Bearing Right, How Conservatives Won the Abortion War. How prescient was that? And Will joined The Bulwark early last year. A lot of folks know, uh, we we talk about The Bulwark quite a bit on this program. The Bulwark um, is an important media outlet which provides political analysis and reporting free from the constraints of partisan loyalties and tribal prejudices. And Will is now the author of an incredible, lengthy, robustly sourced account. I'd expect nothing less from Mr. Salatan. It's called... The Corruption of Lindsey Graham, A Case Study in the Rise of Authoritarianism. Will Salatan, it's so good to see you again. How are you doing? Uh, Great, Corey. It's great to be back with you. When when did we talk? Like, Was it about a year ago? I can't remember. Yeah, it was, um, if I remember correctly, it was like a day or two within, uh, our family has that March 3rd date. It was like the 101st anniversary of when my family landed on Ellis Island. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was 2022, spring of 2022. You know, and I, so, you know, I was listening to that. Um, do, do you ever go back and listen to any prior interviews or read some past pieces? You know, because the, the reason I was thinking it was this account, you go back to 2015 and then kind of work your way forward to see how Lindsey Graham and the Republican Party transformed. Do you go back to check out your own work to see? Not necessarily like, hey, I told you so kind of a thing, but more like to calibrate what you got right, what you got wrong and how your thinking has evolved. Uh, Yeah, I go back. I But when I go back, Corey, I don't I generally don't find things I got right. (laughs) Look, if I got it right, that's great. You know, half the time that's luck. I'm really, really interested in the things I got wrong. And and the older I've gotten. This is one of my life lessons that I would try to impart to younger people. I've gotten more into this as I've gotten older, and I wish I had started it younger. Um, this is what's known in the military as after action reports. You know, you were like, you ex- ruthlessly scrutinize things you did or said, in my case, said or wrote, and look at what you screwed up. It's incredible how much you can learn by looking at your mistakes. And this is, of course, how science works. You're constantly testing and you're, look, you're looking for errors. Don't be looking for what you got right. Be looking for what you got wrong. And um, when I go back, Corey, to 2015, 2016, uh, I see, above all, I was so naive about Donald Trump and about the whole populist movement on the right. And, um, uh, you know, uh, our editor, the, the Bulwark's editor, Jonathan Last, wrote an article today. He was talking about how he did not see this coming in 2015. And I didn't either. I I mean, I thought Donald Trump was nuts, very dangerous. I wrote about, I was right about things I said about Donald Trump being dangerous. But Corey, I wanted Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee for president. For folks who don't know, I come from the sort of center left. I was like, I wanted the Democrats to win the presidential election. I thought this guy is nuts. 
He will absolutely lose a general election. So I want him to be the Republican nominee. And I just wildly underestimated how popular he was going to be and how things that I thought were crazy about, you know, we're going to build a wall and Mexico is going to pay for it and all that stuff. I thought people are too smart for that. No, no. In fact, I was wrong. And so I'm not going to make that mistake again. So I look back at what I wrote eight years ago and I think in this election, I'm not one of the people who's like, let's get Trump nominated on the Republican side because he'll lose. Because if he wins, we just saw what that he can win and what happened when he did. So that's what I see when I look back. You know, uh, you, you've had conversations with Charlie, your regular. By the way, if you, if you like uh, what you're hearing from Will and you're really curious to get more, those convers- those Monday conversations with Will, are, I look forward to that. It's a great way to start the week. Uh, so I've heard you say that even if a Ron DeSantis were nominated, it's still not as I think you're on the side of it. It's still not as bad as Donald Trump. Is, do, do I remember that correctly? Yes. Yes. I I, th- and I I think I have said what this is, and this is, I'll just say it again. I live in Maryland. If we get to the Maryland primary and it's Donald Trump is that there's still a Republican race going on. And if I am eligible, I'm a registered Democrat because I have to be in Maryland to vote in the Democratic primary, which is the whole ball game here. But I am by nature an independent. If I am allowed, I will look at that deadline. And if I can, I would re-register as a Republican and go in and vote for the other candidate. And that includes Ron DeSantis. So I'm not one of these people who thinks Ron DeSantis is just more of the illiberal populism of the right. He is in some ways, but he's not nuts the way Donald Trump is. Um, and I, 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 goal number one is to prevent Donald Trump from being president again. <clears throat> Almost anybody else on the Republican side um, is survivable. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I wasn't going to get into this until until a little bit later, but one of one of my aversions to Ron DeSantis, unlike most of the other Republican candidates, and, and you deal with this actually in the book. The, there's a guidance you you deal at different points. You deal with the why. How could this have happened? And really, a guiding principle is in in Lindsey Graham's case, his hatred for the Democrats, his driving need to defeat the Democrats. Anything would be better than uh, Democrats in power in his mind, or at least in his rhetoric, rhetoric as he explains it. So for me, candidates that it, they are primarily defined, not not by different ideas and, and wanting to win in the forum of ideas, but in how they mischaracterize and demonize uh, folks from the other party, uh, that, that's that's really what defines Ron DeSantis. Uh, he, he's not guided, certainly, by conservative principles. If you look at what he's enacted in Florida, those are not Burkean or Buckleyan uh, conservative principles. So that's that's. And listen, you've made a point that Donald Trump is is a different animal altogether. So I take your point, uh, uh, you know, and you you can expound on that if you like. But that's that's my aversion to to a candidate like like DeSantis, unlike the Christie's of the world or. Um, you know, even to to a degree, t- Tim, you know, uh, Tim Scott from from South Carolina, Nikki Haley. I mean, she does have critiques for the left uh, and s- some of which are hyperbolic. But uh, I don't get the sense that she's ready to literally go go to war. Uh, so I don't know. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So just to be clear. So, Corey, I agree with you. So uh, what I guess what I want to do is draw a couple of distinctions. So I want to separate Trump from everyone else on right. that side, because Donald Trump attempted a self-coup, tried to overthrow. He was in the government, but he tried to overthrow the democratic process that uh, he'd been voted out. And he used, tried, and he discussed using the military to rerun the, I mean, the guy is extremely, extremely dangerous in a way that nobody else on the Republican side is. Okay, let me separate him out. And I would vote for DeSantis over that. But Corey, I agree with you in your comparison of DeSantis to other people on the Republican side. Um, Ron DeSantis is trying to incorporate a lot of the illiberal ideas of the Trump administration, not Trump's personal character, but those ideas and about the use of the state, about executive power. And I'm totally with you on the Burkean stuff. I'm totally with you on this is from a conservative point of view, from a point of view of limited government and constitutionalism, extremely dangerous what DeSantis is doing. 
and he has no compunctions at all about the use of the state, right? We, we hear from today's Republican Party, we've always heard complaints about the socialist left. Now we hear, you know, very casual assertions that Democrats are Marxists or communists, which is not true. But the, you know, what people, what is dangerous most about communism and Marxism is state power being used against political enemies and domestic dissent. And Ron DeSantis is talking about doing that. It's in a more orderly way than Trump. It's not so much in the form of personal vendettas by the executive, but the way Ron DeSantis wants to talk about using tax favors or not to punish companies for their political opinions like Disney, um, the way that DeSantis wants to, also DeSantis is talking like Trump about Schedule F and turning all of the civil service into presidentially appointed, you know, at the, you know, it is on the way to authoritarianism. It is a little bit like Viktor Orban in Hungary. Um, so I would say, I would agree with you that DeSantis is trying to carry on some of those Trumpian ideas and it would be preferable to have any number of other people, Christie, Hutchinson, Scott, Haley, Mike Pence, Mike Pence, Trump's vice president, is a constitutionalist, understands some of those, those barriers, understands limited government. So I agree with you on your distinction between those folks and DeSantis. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So I do want to get, I, I want to dive quite a bit deeper into the book, but before we do that, I, I want to catch up on some things. Um, so it's been about a year and a half, I think, since you've been at the Bulwark. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so, you know, you, you describe yourself as center left. The Bulwark was initially set up as a center right organization. Um, but here's a more specific, I was going to say, how's it going? But a more specific question. You said something last time we talked that traffic rewards the wings. So having been in a, a center-ish, center left, center right, depending on who, who it is at the Bulwark, um, do you still feel that way or, or is working at the Bulwark giving you a little bit more hope that voices from somewhere to one degree or the other uh, toward the center can take some space back from uh, the extremists who, who seem to have dominated the, the, our public spaces for at least these last eight years? It's a it's a very complicated question. It's a great question, Corey. And the it, I guess I would answer it in a couple of ways. In general, I am still concerned about it, it is still true that traffic rewards the wings. And you can see this very clearly on social media where I have had friends who are were moderate and sometimes in private are moderate, but they go on social media and Twitter was the platform on which this occurred most obviously. And they would just start, they would become more and more radical. They would just start saying, they'd just be ranting and just like wild, broad statements about, you know, we're good, they're bad. And like, and all the nuance disappears because what happens is they realize that they're getting rewarded. They're getting a lot of followers and they're getting a lot of engagement for expressing a reliably left or right point of view. In my case, my friends, they, they've gone to the left, right? And uh, it's, I look at what they're saying and I'm like, geez, do you really believe this? Has something happened to you? Um, and it's unnerving to me, but the traffic that they're getting and the followers they're getting is they're clearly being rewarded for it. So that's an incentive structure, right? It's pulling them to the wings. Um, and so that is still a problem. And on the right, it's still a problem. And what's happening at Twitter right now is in a shockingly short time, sort of Elon Musk has sent a signal, you know, this isn't going to be the province of the left media anymore. And I'm going to like take by this place and we're going to investigate it. And I'm going to send signals that this is a place for conservatives. And that's great, except what seems to be happening is a kind of, you know, you've heard of like white flight where all the white people moved out of a neighborhood when the black people moved in. And so the, the liberals, the left is like moving out of Twitter because the right is moving in. And a lot of the people on the right who have moved in are nuts. They're, they're not good. They're not healthy exponents of conservatism, you know, like a lot of people I know are. Um, so some of this is understandable, but it's, we don't seem to be able to get, to, to get an integration. Maybe on Twitter, enough liberals will stay that there will be some left and right integration if there are some better conservative voices. But to your question about the bulwark, I would say, yes, the bulwark has given me hope. I do interact with, hear from, talk to 
people who were Republicans, who sometimes still identify as Republicans, but who are moderate Republicans or even just Reaganite Republicans, people who believe in principles, who, who believed, Corey, in what the Republican platform said up until the moment that they eviscerated it to just become a cult of Donald Trump. I mean, look at Mike Pence. I mean, Pence, can, Pence said things like, you know, you know, limited government, uh, free markets, strong America, um, you know, values, uh, law and order. <laughs> they don't always honor this stuff, but at least, you know, he's saying that. So these are people who are bulwark readers and listeners. And if my answer to you, Corey, is if this can be done, if there is a population in the middle, this is it. This is this is one of them. Um, and there are some on the center left as well. But uh, I am what I'm hoping to do is to help consolidate an audience, a community of people who are not left, who are not right, who are sane. And and there there are clearly, you know, tens of thousands of them, at least, who are forming a part of our community. And the dispatch also has a community of people who are principled conservatives. And so, Corey, it's not a big audience in terms of winning a national election. I can't answer your question in a hopeful way there, but in terms of forming a community of people who can support journalism and, and, and conversation, discussion, like the kind of discussion we're having, I have found it here and I'm very happy about that. Yeah. You know, I, I take your point because part of the problem is, I call it algorithmic. Um, and, and it's not just in in social media or, or digital media, uh, broadcast media. It's also in politics um, that that the uh, Win Red, for example, is an algorithmic organization where someone like uh, Elise Stefanik has become much more extreme because she sees that the the traffic is. Uh, go, goes to the extremes. The algorithms bear that out. And I think in social media, uh, they you get rewarded for the more extreme. You get more likes and interactions and comments and shares uh, based on more extreme. However, where I... I, I also look, there's this expression, uh, I'm not looking at what you say, I'm looking at your feet. And and in our in the public domain, in, in, in our country, we've seen... Um, the action of the feet in a way. So, for example, we'd have to acknowledge that Twitter is at least diminished. If it hasn't had a, a, a demise, it's, it's certainly diminished, largely because of how uh, Elon Musk's takeover and exacerbating some of its worst elements, or Fox News losing three, uh, three quarters of a billion dollar lawsuit uh, for, for defamation, or, or individuals like Tucker Carlson and um, Dan Bongino losing a, a, their broadcast network roles. I see all these developments as clearing more ground for green shoots like the bulwark. Um, but I, I do, I see you smiling, but I'm going to do it. I'm, you're not going to do it, but I will. A shameless plug for the, uh, for, for the bulwark. Uh, you said it beautifully in the acknowledgements uh, of the book. Um, this is the way you put it. People from all parts of the political spectrum who care about democracy and the rule of law have come together to form the Bulwark community. You go on to say, this project is an attempt to make good on the faith that you've placed in us, your readers and listeners, and to those of you who are just learning about the Bulwark. This is the kind of work we do, like your book and the, the podcasts. We're here to preserve the republic. Indeed. So you agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 that's just to come back to that 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 point. By the way, I just wanted to say one thing about the algorithm that you brought up. Yeah, the algorithmic uh, process. Corey, this is happening to me right now with Threads. So you know, Threads just started what a, a week and a half ago. Yeah. I forget yeah. what, right? So I I sign up for Threads, right? And then I'm, it's serving me the Kardashians like it's serving to everybody else. And then I'm like, so I start trying to find other journalists who are like posting news. I want to follow them. But most of them hadn't showed up yet, right? But the the pun the the commentators, the left com the commentators show up, left commentators, right commentators, and I follow some left commentators, a few right ones, but more. So I'm show I'm starting to click on, you know, who I'm following on Threads, and Corey, I can see it happening right in front of me. The algorithm is watching me, and I'm like, you're not showing me 
any of my journalist friends. You're only showing me the like the, the commentators and I'm gonna click some of them, but I can feel it that I'm clicking a few of these and I'm not clicking any journalists because they're not giving it to me. And the algorithm is like, oh, you're a lefty. We're gonna give you more left wing hype. That's a really good point. <laughs> That's a really—it's it's a real problem. No, but back to what you said about the about the uh, the bulwark uh, community. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that I would love to communicate to people about the bulwark is I don't want us to be fighting every policy war because part of what we're doing here is trying to unite people who disagree a lot about policy on just the basics, on the rules of the game. We're going to play basketball, right? And your team is going to try to beat my team and vice versa, right? But what we're not going to do is punch the referees, right? <laughs> what we're not going to do is like ignore the whistle. We're not going to call on the fans to storm the floor, right? When the other team has a fast break or what? So <laughs> like that, it's real basic. And that's the way that I think about the bulwark. And, and it shouldn't be necessary to do that, but it's really important that we have as broad a coalition politically as possible to defend those institutions and rules. Yeah, no, and I'll say one other thing, just to say, just, just to give folks reason to be hopeful. I, I know that a lot of folks are sort of mocking of the Problem Solvers Caucus in the US House, but where I am even more hopeful, call me rose-colored glasses, is that there are Problem Solver Caucus problem solvers caucuses emerging in state legislatures. So I, I think that especially if, if a uh, bipartisan caucus can emerge at the state and local level, then I think there might be some traction uh, and hopefully that'll catch on at the federal level as well. But I do, I do want to get into the, oh, actually one other thing about, about threads. So one of my first follows was um, David French, Nancy French, folks like that. But I made sure to, I think EJ Dion was on there. So I made sure to follow, you know, center right and center left. And yeah, to your point, it was, um, it was feeding me other or giving me other suggestions of who else to follow in that, in that realm, who, who was of who was already on there. Um, or I, you know, I'm a diehard New York Mets fan. But the difference is if I put, uh, you know, I'm following New York Mets and different players from the Mets on Twitter, I'd all of a sudden be hounded by Philly fans, and Yankee fans, whereas on threads, they're just giving me the post like, hey, isn't it wonderful today that the Mets, you know, they got one hit, <laughs> you know, just it's a different, I don't know, it just has, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it just definitely has a different vibe on threads, so. Yeah, uh, maybe they set up the algorithm to be to not be Twitter, to yeah. not reward hostile engagement. I don't know how you do that, but I'm sure they're whizzes at it. I'm sure, I'm sure they can figure it out. So, okay, so we did talk last time. One of the things that really struck me in reading the book was how well sourced your work always is. I, I, I was talking, to, I had a chance to talk to Jennifer Rubin a few weeks ago, and uh, it made me think of you the first time from the first time we talked. Her work is referred to as reported opinion. And boy, howdy, you got like reported opinion in there. Every single page has multiple links that I could dive into. So I was curious if you, if you could share your process, whether um, it's for the regular columns in the Bulwark or for this larger project, how do you do all the research, curate all of it, put it together in something coherent and cohesive like that? Uh, well, uh, let me give you a general answer and then a specific answer about this, this book. So the general answer is, as I've gotten older, I, you know, when I was in my, you know, 20s and 30s, I was like, young person, like, I've got opinions. Here's what I think about the world. I'm going to change everything. I'm going to open your mind when I'm a, and I would just like write, I would write opinion. And I was, it was the blog era. It was, you know, the early days of Slate. And, you know, and I got some things right and I got some things wrong. And I said a lot of stupid things. And, you know, and I sort of looked back at that as I got older and thought, you know, did you really add much to the world? What did you really know about what you were saying? I mean, I argued for the Iraq war when we went in and like, I, I, you've got this huge thing wrong. Okay. I didn't actually cause the war, but like, I, you, and I've done some other stupid things. So, I just, the older I've gotten, the more I'm interested in bringing information, bringing um, evidence, bringing news, something that, because we all have a background, we all have an opinion, an attitude about the world. And what we should be doing all the time is learning, right? And you persuade other people when they're wrong, but what you persuade them with is facts, you know, like there's an argument going on about the weaponization of the Department of Justice and the government. And how are we gonna settle this? Well, it can't just be my side shouting against your side. Let's bring some facts. Let's be like, okay, 
What is your hypothesis? Your hypothesis is that there is a weaponization of the Justice Department against conservatives. Okay, specifically you say against the Trump-Pence administration, right? Mike Pence says it was weaponized, it is weaponized against the Trump-Pence administration. Well, let's see, we've had a prosecution of Donald Trump for mishandling and withholding classified documents from the government. Then we have Mike Pence, also accused of, of having classified documents. He did have classified documents in his house. What did the so-called weaponized Department of Justice do? Well, looky here, we have a letter from the Department of Justice telling Mike Pence, you won't be prosecuted because unlike Donald Trump, you didn't withhold the, and obstruct the recovery of the documents from the government, hide them. You didn't, you know, you didn't commit all the crimes that are in the indictment against Donald Trump. So your hypothesis of weaponized government against the Trump Pence administration and against conservatives is falsified. Some conservatives get prosecuted, some don't, and it depends on what they did. That is law enforcement. So that's just an example of bringing a fact to bear on a political argument. So I'm a big believer in doing that. And when I write, I try to bring facts rather than just express opinions. On the Lindsey Graham story in particular, this is a different thing. Corey, this was a whole other level of research for me. Um, and the reason why I wrote about Lindsey Graham, because I looked at a whole, I, I wanted to write about the general process of collaboration among leading Republicans with Trump. How did this happen? Including people like Marco Rubio, who, Paul Ryan, people who said at the outset that Donald Trump was bad. They knew what was he was bad. And then they just found reasons to change. The reason why I wrote it about Lindsey Graham was that Lindsey Graham simply talked more than anyone else. He talked, he just, he, mm -hmm. he has lots of social media, but yeah. he did interviews, TV interviews, radio interviews. So it was possible to get week to week, day to day, find out what he said. There's, there's a recording of that. That isn't true of Kevin McCarthy. I can't write this piece about Kevin McCarthy or Mitch McConnell because they were not as loud, not as frequent. And so that's why there is, it was possible to do this enormous amount of research. Why I did it is a whole other question. And I can get into that if you want. Sure. So I, I do want to ask you about that, but you mentioned you started with a hypothesis. I was wondering <clears throat> if in the process of doing all this research, if you, if, if there was anything that surprised you, in other words, it's one thing to curate and collate all of this information into a narrative and then to track with the step-by-step -step demise of Lindsey Graham and the Republican Party more broadly. But I was wondering if any of your beginning hypothesis turned out to be wrong in some way, or was it that you just found the new, uh, you came to understand what actually happened better? That's a very good question. And this is something that I definitely want to convey to any journalist or people in general. I, you should think, try to think like a scientist, right? The way a scientist should think and the way scientists generally do think is you, you have a hypothesis and what you do is you don't go out looking for evidence to confirm your hypothesis. You go out for looking for evidence to falsify your hypothesis. You're trying to learn, you know, is it wrong? And if you don't falsify it, it remains plausible and increasingly likely that it's true. Um, so in, in writing this story, I had an idea of what happened to Graham. And there were constantly things that, that um, complicated the story. Um, the, I mean, the simplest thing is there are a lot of people who think that Lindsey Graham is an empty suit. He believes nothing. He's just, he's sold out to Donald Trump, right? And when you actually read the history of what Graham wrote, said, and you, and you watch the videos and you listen to the interviews, um, it's very clear that that is not true. Lindsey Graham fought like cats and dogs with Donald Trump about the things Lindsey Graham cared about. And those were almost without exception, national security and foreign policy issues. Trump, and I, I, and I wrote this in the story, Trump is an isolationist, right? I'm, we're gonna, oh, we don't wanna mess with the Russians. Uh, well, let's pull out of Ukraine, that kind of thing. Lindsey Graham is not. Lindsey Graham is an internationalist he wanted to keep troops in Syria. He wanted to keep troops in Afghanistan. Uh, he wanted to stand up to the Russians when Donald Trump didn't. He was trying to tell Trump that Putin was a bad guy. And to this day, Lindsey Graham is one of the most stalwart defenders of Ukraine. And he's in a party that is abandoning that. And Lindsey Graham is 
He is not a coward about all things. He's a coward about Trump, but he is courageous about the things he cares about. And the so the criticism of Lindsey Graham can't be that he has no values, and it can't be that he's afraid to stand up to Donald Trump, because neither of those things is true. The criticism, you have to, again, reshape the hypothesis to fit the evidence. And the criticism that's valid is that he essentially sold out uh, a lot of do the domestic side of the Trump agenda to win the national security and foreign policy part of the Trump agenda. And he, Lindsey Graham had enormous success in lobbying Trump to be more of an internationalist. And a really good example, Corey, is I was writing about the Ukraine investigation. So that whole thing blows up in you know September of 2019. And Lindsey Graham is just ruthlessly lying on behalf of Donald Trump. It's I'm not gonna even look at the evidence. This whole thing is illegitimate. It's just an extension of, you know they just wanna get Trump. So he's being absolutely cynical and ruthless about that. But what's going on at the same time, if you watch Graham's interviews, Graham is fighting hard to keep troops in Syria because Trump is going he wants to pull troops out of Syria. And so there's, it's a transaction. And there's a couple of points where Lindsey Graham actually says, you know, why am I, why am I standing with Trump? Because he's making decisions about North Korea and about Iran and about Syria. And I care about all these things. So it was a transaction. And that's an example of how I ended up modifying the thesis to fit the facts. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you talk a lot about how politicians make bargains and are under the impression they're, they're sort of self-deluding that uh, they'll make this bargain, but they can hold on to their um, founding principles, which has happened. You know, so he was out there defending Trump on one thing um, in order to say to say to him through the Fox News cameras um, to try to make a case for staying in Syria, for example. You know, but but. The other thing that's striking that's kind of related to that is that someone's transformation doesn't happen in an instant. It, it doesn't it, it happens gradually, one decision at a time, one 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 capitulation, as you would as you would say, at a time. What was the starting point for Lindsey Graham? When did he take those first steps towards his own corruption? Uh, great question. And the answer is. I mean, I was planning to start writing the part of the story where Graham capitulates when Trump got elected. Trump becomes president. And now because I Graham goes on TV and he started he's totally sucking up and oh, let's forget all that stuff I said about you. You know, I'm, I'm you're, you're my president and, you know, you beat me like a drum. It's really it's gross, Corey, the, the groveling that went on. Right. So I thought that was going to be the beginning of the story. But the beginning of the story of the capitulation was actually when Trump got the nomination. And it was even before he technically got the nomination. When Ted Cruz dropped out in May of 2016, that was the end of any plausible resistance to Trump. At that point, Trump had the nomination wrapped up. And Graham, to his credit, fought to the end. He went through like, I'm going to run it. I'm running for president. Then he has to drop out. That's not working. Then he's moving over to Jeb. He's going to support Jeb Bush. We all should rally around Jeb. Too late by that point. Jeb's gone. And he goes over, Lindsey Graham goes over to support Ted Cruz, who he absolutely hated and bashed, right? And anyway, it, he, so he did a, six, a series of things to try to stop the party from coalescing around Trump. Then Cruz drops out. And, and that's when, I mean, Trump phoned up, he called Graham and, you know, and he schmoozed him a little bit. He, but, it, but basically, once Donald Trump became the de facto Republican nominee for president, now, every Republican in Congress and every Republican who's going to be on the ticket that fall needs Donald Trump to do well in the election. So it, it just created an incentive right away. And the modification at that point wasn't that Donald Trump is awesome and he's the greatest guy in the world. The modification for Lindsey Graham was, you know, Donald Trump keeps saying things that I don't like. Like he keeps talking about keeping Muslims out of the country and that kind of thing. But... I'm not going to say anymore that he's a bad person, that he's vicious and that and dangerous, which is what Graham was saying before. I'm going to say, please stop saying things like ban Muslims. <laughs> you know, it's it's became a kind of coaching. So the modification was slight and only gradually in a series of steps did it later become more, you know, Donald Trump is the most wonderful thing and let's all worship Trump. Right. You know, the other part that you kind of track and, and you made the point at a, a couple different um, 
stops along the way is that it, it's not just one's decisions or, or one's votes or even one's rhetoric that changes. The person himself or herself, like we, I mentioned, at least the phonic changes. Yeah, it's it's uh, people are not often self-aware. <laughs> and when so think about politicians, politicians are calculating. Uh, I don't mean to insult all politicians. They believe things, right? But they make calculations. I believe in a uh, hundred things here. This one's going to get me in a lot of trouble. This one's going to put me crossways with my base. Uh, you know what? We're going to take a pass on that issue. or We're going to vote the, the way I don't actually believe because I actually care about these other things more and I got to keep my seat. And so they're, they're always making these calculations. And they often tend to think of it in terms of I'm a calculator. I believe things. And I'm making calculations, but I'm maneuvering my way through this political world, right? And I'm trying to get to objectives and values that I have always believed in. And sometimes they're not very aware of how the process of making those concessions and calculations and navigations changes who they are. And it's a kind of, I mean, people who, I think people who understand religion understand this inherently because religion is about your soul. It's about your character, who you are as a person, your values. And everyone understands the, in religion, the idea of corruption, right? You, the idea of literally selling, of selling your soul. So this is a kind of, it's not you're selling your soul, but you're, he was parceling it out a piece at a time. You start telling yourself things like, um, you know, he, that Don, oh, you know, Donald Trump says these, the, let's go back to the one about coaching, right? He keeps saying he's going to ban Muslims and, you know, but you know what? I bet we can talk him out of this. I bet, you know, cause he's, he's going to give us the judges we want. Look at all the good judges. And, and they did get three Supreme court justices they really wanted. Um, so he's going to give us these things. Let's just try to coach him about when he goes overboard and talks about, you know, torturing people or, you know, trying to kill the family members of suspected terrorists or, you know, the, it, those are, those are unfortunate things. And let's try to, and, and so, it's a very small change that you make, but you start to you start to lose your values when you do that because you quickly forget what you what you know you forget that character matters and that the reason why this guy shouldn't be president is because of who he is, not because of you know one particular thing you could coach him out of. You know, and we've talked a little bit about the bargain, you know, making the bargain, uh, appeasing Trump on one thing in order to get another thing. But it's still confound the, the 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 mystery is the why, you know, it was that the, the whole reason why that he was making these capitulations in order to get uh, small victories somewhere else or in order to be able to have access and have influence? Or was there some other big why at work? No, I think the why is. He always wanted to be in the middle of the action. This is a criticism of Graham that is generally true. And, you know, there's an interesting interview that just happened in April. Um, Lindsey Graham, you know, when Jamal Khashoggi was murdered, right, the CIA does a report, they investigate it, and they're like, okay, this was ordered by the crown prince, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman. Lindsey Graham cuts off Mohammed bin Salman. I'm not going to Saudi Arabia. I'm not going to have anything to do with him. He had been like their number one. He and McCain had been their biggest supporters. The Saudis he says, no, I'm taking a moral position here, right? Five years later, the, the Saudis are, MBS is still there. They've not deposed him. You know, he's the crown prince is going to take over the country. They're buying $37 billion worth of Boeing aircraft made in South yeah, Carolina. Right. And Lindsey Graham goes over there and he does an interview with Al, Ar with Al Arabiya, the Saudi TV operation. And he says, you know, they ask, why are you here? And he says, well, you, you bought $37 billion worth of aircraft from us, so I'm here to say thank you. And then he talks about, you know, he says FOMO, FOMO, F-O-M-O, -O, fear of missing out. So he actually says this. <laughs> Eventually, people blurt out what they think. Wow. And this is Lindsey Graham. He wants to be in the middle of the action, and he always did. So by capitulating to Trump and becoming not just friendly, he became Trump's best buddy and his advocate in Congress. He gets to be going to the White House all the time. And he did get Trump's ear and he did get to talk to him. He got to play golf. And he's he's not just there for, you know, the attention. He's there to talk to Trump about things he cares about. And he, he did. So I think the why is the influence and being in the center of the action. But to Corey, I don't want to be too cynical about this. 
Graham did believe, does believe in things, and he did make a bargain. He did get something for it. And the question is, was it worth it? And I think morally the answer is no. And there was one other thing I wanted to say. You asked about what happens to you over time. And I, the, the example that comes to mind now is by the time that Donald Trump loses the 2020 election, right? Graham has gone into this whole thing. I need to suck up to Donald Trump because he's the president. He controls policy, right? So Trump loses the election. He won't control policy anymore, right? right? So this is Graham's chance. This is Lindsey Graham's chance to let go, right? Does he let go? Right. Which is what that was the bargain at to begin with. That was the deal at the beginning. Right. No, because Lindsey Graham has changed. And by this point, 2020, at the end of 2020, Lindsey Graham doesn't believe anymore that the Republican Party can win without Donald Trump. And he's, he's in a hostage situation that he's got himself into. And he's not willing to lose because he he talked himself into you, you raised the question about hating our enemies, what the hate does. And Corey, the worst, I mean, the, the hate, it rots your soul. But what it also does is it lowers the threshold of what you will support. Because the more evil you can convince yourself the other party is, the more evil you will support on the theory that your guy is less evil than theirs, right? right? So no matter what Donald Trump does, that Lindsey Graham is no longer able to abandon him, even though at that point, Trump no longer had the levers of policy. Yeah, I, I took a note of uh, the, something you said toward the end of the book or getting toward the end of the book. Like many other Republicans, he had offered his fealty to when Trump won the presidency. Then for four years, Graham and his colleagues had defended or ignored Trump's abuses of power. They had rationalized this complicity as a necessary bargain by earning the pre president's trust. They had influenced his policy decisions and restrained his worst impulses. Now that bargain was no longer necessary, Trump would soon be out of power, and yet he didn't let go, to your point. Somebody else did, though. So I'm wondering if you wrote this account focusing on – it's funny. You, you mentioned that you supported the Iraq war. You've almost – you've come 360 on uh, on the Cheneys. <laughs> You're on the same <laughs> – so in all seriousness, if you wrote the account about Liz Cheney, would it be similar up until the last chapter or were there other points that foreshadowed her eventual split? Uh, I don't know. I haven't – I'd have to go research what she said all along. I, I will tell you, Corey, that <clears throat> I was furious at Liz Cheney throughout that two years leading up to the 2020 election, because she was the chair of the House Republican conference. And she was one of the most ruthless people. I, I watched all these press conferences and she would constantly call the Democrats socialists. And like, she would just caricature them. And, you know, she was, she was doing the ideological polarization that, that a lot of Republicans do. And I was, so I, I just thought she's, you know, she's really bad. <laughs> And then it was very much to my surprise, um, it shouldn't have been if I had paid a little closer attention, but it was very much to my surprise that she that she drew a line against Trump. I mean, she, she, I believe she has said that she voted for Trump again in 2020. Yeah. So none of the stuff that I describe in the Lindsey Graham story about Trump usurping congressional power and um, you know violating basic rules of the constitution, violating institutions, none of that seems to have been enough to turn her away from Trump. It wasn't until he actually tried to mount a coup that she stopped, but she did. Yeah. She at that point she said, "This is unacceptable." I give her credit. I, I am, I am, I am not a Christian, Corey, but I welcome all converts. <laughs> that was my next question: is, is, is you know, Trump? If he does anything, he provides so many off ramps. You know, to like, if it wasn't the coup, it was the documents. If it wasn't the documents, it was you know, getting uh, being held liable for sexual abuse. Like, there are so many off ramps to get off the Trump train. You know, but uh, so you, you're holding out hope. You, there's still there's still time to exit that train. Yeah. I, it, it, we're down to disposition at this point. I got colleagues at the Bulwark. I, you know, I got my buddy JBL who is like, oh, people are the worst, you know. And he's like, he and he he holds his grudges, and that's he. I love him, but he's like, he's, he, you know, he, that's the way he thinks. And I'm, I just got to be who I am, yeah. right? And I'm, I'm a, I'm a simp. I'm a softy. I'm like, you know, there must be some good reason why the, this person disagrees with me. And so I'm always surprised when there isn't. Um, but you know, somebody like so Liz Cheney. Good for her. Good for her. Yeah. I disagree with her on ninety five percent of whatever, but you know she stood up against uh, this attempt to overthrow our government. Good for Chris Christie. 
Chris Christie, who right up until Trump, the, the, he was doing debate prep for Donald Trump in 2020. Like, he's, oh, I, I realized Donald Trump was bad. No, you didn't. You were with him right up until the point of the coup attempt. Right. But Chris Christie is out there now. God bless him. You know, even Mike Pence, late to the game fella, but you didn't try to return the electoral votes on January 6th. And you're now speaking the truth about Trump. And, you know, you're still a sucker. But, you know, I, we need all these people. Asa Hutchinson. Even Nikki Haley, who I think is a weasel on so many yeah. things, you know, if Nikki Haley will, will be responsible now, I, I welcome. Right, her. right. So I'm not going to have you answer this because I think folks should should listen to the your the audio version of it. I think they should 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 buy the book. Uh, but after doing all this work, I, I love toward the end of it, you, you you set out on this endeavor to do to better understand how authoritarian authoritarianism takes hold in, in a country, in particular in our country. Um, and, and you lay out some really uh, compelling conclusions, scary conclusions, but certainly persuasive. One one thing I was I did I was curious about, um, and then I have some other questions for you. Um, we can get off the book. You mentioned toward the end of the book that uh, Lindsey Graham wouldn't sit down for an interview for it. But do you know ha has he read it or has he heard about it or heard pieces of it? Uh, I don't know if he's read it. It's a hundred pages, <laughs> um, but he. You know, I and and again, this is not. I did not speak directly to him. I asked for an interview. I, you know, talked to his press department, and they were just like, "Write what you want." He has no interest. Doesn't he? Doesn't, doesn't want. I mean, I told them what I was going to ask him about. I just like, here's. I wanted to be just outright about it. And I was, you know, maybe I, you know, I, I didn't want to sandbag the guy. Yeah. I'm like, I, and I, you know, he knows what I write for the Bulwark, and he knows what I've written about him. Um, but I, I said, here's what I want to talk about, and and. Corey, I really wanted this interview. I mean, I didn't fight to the death for it, but I thought it really would help. You know, I would like to hear his voice, um, you know, and but probably because I said it was going to be about Trump and he knew we didn't want to talk about Trump. Uh, you know, what he's increasingly and this is an interesting trajectory that I know from having done the research. I could get a lot of interviews of Lindsey Graham on CNN back in 2015 and 2016. Today, you can get a lot of interviews with Chris Christie on on the CNN and MSNBC and that kind of thing, right? Graham over time shifted. He just shifted toward into Fox News, and then he ended up doing some Newsmax stuff. And it's it's this with it's part of what we talked about the algorithm with retreating into the wings. So Graham's doing more and more friendly media. Right. Um, so you know, I'm sure that you know he didn't want to talk to somebody who was openly going to criticize him about this. But I would have liked to hear. However, I I think it was more important to get contemporaneous records. Mm. Like Lindsey Graham, if you read Bob Woodward's book, yeah. it's clear that Lindsey Graham talks to him a lot. And what you're getting is Lindsey, what Lindsey Graham wants you to think about what he was thinking and doing, you know, two years ago. I, I didn't really trust that. I wanna know what Lindsey Graham actually said two years ago. I wanna see the record. And so I used contemporaneous video and audio so I would know what Lindsey Graham thought and said back then. So I didn't actually need the interview to write this story. And I didn't entirely trust what he was going to tell me. But I still think it would have been useful to hear him explain himself. Yeah, I, that, that'd be interesting. I, I'd love to. But it's probably not an account that we're going to get, at least not for any, not anytime soon. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, I just I, I think folks get too entrenched and and there's just no coming back. But, you know, like, like, like I said before, and, and your disposition is there's always an off ramp. <laughs> the, the, the water's warm. Come on in whenever you're ready. Um, so how do you think the Biden administration is doing? And does your view of how it's been going so far defer from your, a lot of your colleagues at the Bulwark? No, I, I mean, I, I'm kind of surprised how much they agree with me, right? I'm supposed to be the house lib, right? So like, I, I, like Joe Biden a lot. I was a Mayor Pete guy, by the way. So I was Me like too, actually, a yeah. Biden guy, but I was, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm like, I, I like, I like red state Democrats. I like blue state Republicans too. I like Larry Hogan. I mean, people who are, have to modify to sort of fit like Pete Buttigieg sort of, because he's from Indiana, understands sort of cultural conservatism. The guy's gay, but he understands like people's values in, he, he's not in a blue echo chamber yeah. is what I'm saying. Larry Hogan had to deal with the Democratic legislature that made him a good governor. I mean, he was by nature the sort of person who could do that. But 
Um, so I like those folks. And Joe Biden is is basically a moderate Democrat. He's in some ways he's to my left on on some issues. Um, but I generally like Biden. What surprises me is that my colleagues at the Boer coming from, you know, they're like bushies, yeah. <laughs> but they like Joe Biden, too, which is great. And it 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 actually confirms that they're setting aside policy differences like my buddy Charlie Sykes is conservative, right? He disagrees with Biden about a lot of economic questions. Um, he probably disagrees with him about a lot of crime policy and stuff like that. But Charlie is serious that democracy is issue number one, right? You know, institutions, the rules of the game, preserving our republic. And so there are a whole lot of people at the bulwark who come from this Republican, this Bush Republican background, who are setting aside those policy differences and saying, we're going to support the Joe Biden, because we need to have a unified alternative to the illiberalism of Trump. We got to protect the Republic. And it's a temporary deal. If some Republican comes along who, dis who agrees with them politically and isn't a threat to the Republic, agrees with these norms, I imagine a lot of my Bulwark friends will go back to supporting that person. But it may be a while, Corey, before we get to a, get to a point where the Republican Party or something like it, or its successor would nominate such a person. Yeah, yeah, I, I've appreciated, specifically what I've appreciated is the bipartisan nature of every major piece of legislation. You know, e even the recent, uh, you know, the debt ceiling negotiated with McCarthy. He specifically negotiated one-on-one, -on -one, kicked out uh, Chuck and, and uh, Jeffries, uh, and, and just negotiated one-on-one -on -one and, and let McCarthy have a win. Uh, but he, I don't, th I don't know if McCarthy knows how to have a win. But he got a lot of what he wanted, or the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the the uh, chips, um, the Ukraine. He has bipartisan support, even though some Republicans are now peeling away. Um, but uh, you know, or or on guns, it was the Republican senator from Texas who led uh, negotiations on that bill. So the specific reason that I appreciate what's happened so far in these two and a half years is that the major pieces of legislation somehow miraculously, even in this climate, has been bipartisan. Um, I, I wanted, I'd i love to get some, I, I know you're not supposed to do this, but I'm going to ask you to do some prognostications first on all of the different cases. If we look at you know, there is one uh, there are two indictments out or two sets of indictments out so far, one in New York and one with Jack Smith in the documents case. I think there are two pending uh, it, within the next couple of weeks, uh, one uh, uh, on the January 6th, again, with Jack Smith, with the one in Georgia with Fonnie Willis. Um, uh, at, what is your assessment so far? Where do you think we're going with all these cases? Will 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 cases be heard? I know the one uh, in New York is scheduled for next spring, but do you think cases will actually be heard before the 2024 election? And how do you think that's all going to go? Uh, I, don't, I don't know about the legal timeline. It depends on a lot of legal questions, what motions are filed, what how they get kicked up to courts, how long that stuff takes. The documents case is a mess because... Um, although I think it's the most straightforward case, you got the issue of classified records being aired in court and, you know, who can be cleared to look at them and which documents to, that could, that could raise some complications. So I don't know about the timing. Um, I'm much more concerned, Corey, about the, the disease in the Republican party, mm. the, this sort of, the, um, it, it's a party that increasingly defines itself in opposition to law enforcement which is weird for me because I, growing up, I thought Republicans were the party of law and order, but that's clearly not true. Um, there's way more interest in undermining and defunding law enforcement, it, like the FBI, the federal level in the Republican party than there is in the Democratic party about police. It's a much more of a minority position in the Democratic party. Um, so, and, and I mean, just today we, you know, I'm watching this Kevin McCarthy, and then Elise Stefanik and Steve Scalise, the House Republicans, doing a couple of, of press conferences, talking about the you know news about Trump being uh, told that he's a target of you know the J six investigation, and um, that the the message is that they're putting out is you know this is more weaponization of government. It's clear that. I mean, Donald Trump, let, I'll just put my cards on the table. Donald Trump is a criminal. He's a lifelong career criminal. He's the sort of person who commits crimes and manages to get away with them up to the point where finally he's being indicted. Uh, and because he's a criminal who does crimes, he gets in trouble and law enforcement comes after him. That's why they come after him. It's not a political vendetta. It's because he's a criminal. And so 
the message that, that the Republicans are putting out, that the House Republicans are putting out, is they're coming after him again and again and again, not because he, you know, violated campaign finance law in New York, not because he, you know, obstructed recovery of classified documents, not because he attempted in various illegal ways to overthrow the 2020 election, et cetera. Uh, it's not because of all that evidence against him. It's just that, you know, it's, it's the deep state out to get him. And so my concern is we have evidence in the polls that he goes up. He, get, he gets more support among Republicans with every one of these indictments. And I'm seeing today, you know, Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley trying to find ways to use this against him. The fact that he's a criminal who keeps getting indicted and they're just struggling. They're struggling because of the sickness in this party. So I'm very worried that the indictments, that the more this accumulates against Trump, the more that narrative of the deep state out to get him and the weaponization of government will take hold and Trump will continue to rise in the Republican Party and win the Republican nomination. And then, Corey, we're at the mercy of, in a general election between this criminal, this authoritarian, and the Democratic alternative, who is really old, really old, something bad could happen, or he could, like, you know, screw up in a debate, or just any number of little things could happen. And then Trump's got a 45% chance, 50% chance of winning a general election. And returning this tyrant to power, that's really scary to me. And I don't, I don't look at these indictments as a solution to the problem. Um, I, I just because I'm very worried about the Republican electorate and the risks in a general election. Yeah, a lot of folks are more bullish on if it does get to the general with Trump and Biden, that it's even more of a slam dunk. E even Mike Madrid, whose whose analysis I really appreciate and respect. He knows a heck of a lot, as as Ron Steslo, his friend, says. He eats numbers for breakfast. He really knows his numbers. Um, he's he's uh, he's especially bullish because the there's a uh, built-in advantage of being in office. Uh, so there is that. But at the end of the day, the general is going to be decided by tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but tens of thousands of voters across four or five states, Arizona, Georgia, maybe North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, maybe Michigan. But that's a really thin margin to your point. I do have to one more plug for another show on the Bulwark. It's um, the uh, I think it's Thursdays. Ben Wittes comes on with Charlie last week. Uh, um, oh, yeah. It was Tim Miller who, who did it with uh, Ben Wittes. It's a great account on a week by week basis of all of the different cases that are out there. Um, and and it, it really helps non-lawyers like me get a better understanding of each case um, and what the process is, where we are in the process. So uh, uh, yet another plug for the <laughs> show. Love it. So Love since it. We're, Love it. Ben, ben is terrific. Yeah. Since we're doing some prognostication, how, so what, how, where do you think things are going? Uh, House, Senate, state legislatures, uh, presidency, uh, I'm giving. By the way, this is a gift. I'm giving you an opportunity to look back on something, you know, a, a year and a half from now to to regret. Oh, I regret having said that. So now say what oh. you're going to regret later. Okay. First, I have to. My number one caveat, folks. I have a terrible, terrible record as a prognosticator. Okay. Right. I, I'm. I am so wrong. I literally wrote an article in September of 2000 called "Why Bush Is Toast." Right. Because the election was over and. Gore had it in the bag. Right. And I mean, it, it, I, I have an unbroken record of getting things horribly wrong. I, I, I am, I'm the guy at the bulwark who said six months ago or whenever it was, you know, I'm taking the field against Trump. <laughs> you know, I, I think DeSantis has this, don't worry. So uh, even if DeSantis wins in the end, I'm already falsified in my thinking about that. Uh, so, so having said that my prognostications are worthless, I'll do a, a little bit of prognostication. Um, I, I am, I do think Biden is going to get reelected. That's the bottom line. Uh, I, I, and as I say it, I, I mean, I think he's going to get reelected because the underlying facts are working in his direction. Inflation, the, the, the what were the big threats to Biden? Not inflation. Number right. one, um, uh, border stuff, a major issue, major problem, uh, that has come down a little bit. Also, uh, the, the border influx. Uh, crime, crime had surged, another big problem, major issue for Republicans. That has subsided in a lot of cities, not everywhere. Um, so 
as long as the economy starts to do pretty well, and as long as the border isn't so terrible that people beyond the Fox News audience are really, really worried about it, and as long as crime is not so out of control in so many cities that um, that suburbanites start to vote uh, against the Democrats in a more to more than they have, then I think Biden probably gets reelected. Um, I'm not entirely happy about having a president go. He'd be what 82 yeah. starting his next yeah. term. It's too old. He's already too old. Um, but he's not nuts. He's not going to overthrow our democracy. He's very sensible. He's not as Joe Biden isn't as with it as Bernie Sanders is. But Joe Biden's politics are more moderate, more sane than Bernie Sanders, in my opinion. Um, so I'm pretty comfortable with that. And on the Republican side, I I guess I have to. I mean, the evidence right now looks to me like it's going to be very hard to overtake Trump. I just saw Corey um, a poll out of New Hampshire this morning that showed Trump was at 37, DeSantis at 23, and other people in sort of high, high to low single digits. That does give me some hope. It, it, I'm looking at that Trump number, and it's a crowded field. And if it can winnow quickly, if and Trump can only draw 37% in the New Hampshire, which is a state that you know rescued him at the beginning of the 2016 cycle. And if that Trump number remains low and somebody can come up and consolidate the non-Trump vote, Trump is beatable. But you'd have to say the odds are against that right now. The national numbers are terrible in terms of Trump dominating the field. Um, can somebody surge in Iowa? If they don't, can... DeSantis or Christie or somebody surging. I don't, I don't think Christie can do it. So I'm not optimistic about the Republican Party. And then I'm at the mercy of the general election and the story that I often tell about the, the Trump and the general election and about, about how close things get is in, tw in 2016, I was working for Slate and I was asked to go talk to the Washington Post editorial, not the editorial board, the board of the Post company have a political reporter come in and talk about the election and what's going to happen. And I told them Trump was going to lose. Trump was going to lose to Hillary Clinton. And the reason was I had looked at all the national polls. There was no poll, zero, no national poll in which Donald Trump was above 45% and leading, right? So he was going to lose. Donald Trump won that election 46 to 48. He lost by two points. It didn't matter because of the Electoral College. And Trump right now is in, you know, the low 40s, mid 40s in some of these polls. So he can absolutely win again. And none of us should rest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do think one thing we know for sure is you don't know anything for sure. There's a lot of time. There's an eternity between now and twenty and November of 2024. I do think these cases matter. I, I, I'd be very surprised if... The four major cases, two at the state level um, and two different ones um, with the uh, with Jack Jack Smith is leading. I think that there might be one where uh, a jury unanimously uh, finds him not guilty. But I think his best case scenario in at least three out of four of the other cases is a hung jury. That's a best case scenario for Trump. I just, I mean, we, we, we see all, uh, so much of the evidence is already in the public domain. We, we, we know what it is. So I think that being the case, so to speak, that's going to change things. If he's found guilty in even one of these between now and November of 2024, that's going to change things. Yes, there will be appeals. I don't think he's going to be in an orange jumpsuit. I think if he's found guilty, it'll be something about staying at Mar-a-Lago or, you know, some sort of there'll be some sort of other accommodations made, but I just think that changes things um, for, or maybe not. Maybe he runs his campaign from a freaking jail cell. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, still, I, I, I just don't. I, I, the, the thing I keep coming back to, Corey, is what are we going to find out? We're going to find out. What's the strongest case? The strongest case, in my opinion, is the documents case. It's, they're they, Jack Smith's got him dead to rights violations. We get the, you know, the, there's the video of moving the boxes. There's like the audio of him, you know, waving around the classified documents. He's definitely guilty of those crimes. So he gets convicted. Uh, you know, is that, then there's going to be an appeal, you know, he's going to say they're coming after me. It's just a bunch of paperwork. There's already the, it's just paperwork defense. I, I just don't see, I mean, Corey, this guy 
he tried to coerce the Justice Department, the Secretary of State of Georgia, people in Arizona, the, you know, set up fake electors, talk about getting the military to over, overturn the election, try to coerce the vice president to return electoral votes to stop the county. He, he sends a mob to the, gets a mob, they go to the Capitol, he sits there for three hours, does nothing. And all these Republicans, the rank and file, they know all this. This was all aired. They don't care. And if they don't care about that, I'm really hard pressed to understand what it is in these, in the documents case or in the, you know, the Stormy Daniels case or in any of these other cases, they're going to care about so much that they're going to turn against Trump. I, I, I've lost my faith. Yeah. I've lost my faith that that's going to move them. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. There was a, a great piece in Just Security. I don't know if you read that uh, prosecution memo. It was about uh, six or seven attorneys from across multiple disciplines who laid out three major charges uh, that they can uh, – that that e even just on the information that they have, not knowing obviously what's in the grand jury testimonies, uh, but just even seeing what's in the public domain, what the three major charges are. If you haven't read it, um, look it up, Prosecution Memo in Just Security. Th I think it came out on Thursday or Friday. Um, but uh, I, I have other questions. I, you know, I'm going to forego my regular TPNR question because it, it's what what can we do to be better at talking politics and religion without killing each other? Because I have a, a substitute question that I think will – um, we've already been talking about a lot of that, but I, ha I have a substitute question I, I think will be meaningful to you. Uh, I just recently had Pete Weiner and John Rausch uh, come on the program together. It was awesome. Um, we did a two-parter. Uh, the second part was a tribute to their friends, Tim Keller and Mike Gerson, both of whom passed away within the last year. I, I, I'm not sure if you knew Tim Keller, but I, on the last time, the last time you came on the program, you did talk about your relationship with Michael Gerson. So I was wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing some of your thoughts on your friendship with him and what he meant to you. So I did not know Mike as the way other people did. I was just, uh, I mean, I went to, con I, I went to, you know, the faith angle conference several times with him and, uh, had other conversations with him around that. And as part of that, as part of the, the faith angle forum generally. Um, and you know, so Mike was obviously, uh, an evangelical Christian and a speechwriter for George W. Bush. And I was very much against George W. Bush and I was against the Christian right. And I had, you know, very hostile views about evangelicals, uh, conservative evangelicals um, on a lot of issues. Um, but, you know, M Mike was just obviously a person of deep integrity and you could talk to him and he, he had, and there, there were, there were gut tests of like, we, so you and I, we were just talking about, the scientific method. You have a hypothesis. Is it true or false? Let's consult evidence. Well, uh, there's a caricature of of the of people on the religious right of the the Mike Gersons that they don't care about poor people. Mike Gerson obviously did. Mike Gerson, you know, the the whole PEPFAR initiative, the whole, everything George W. Bush did around AIDS cared intensely about that. Um, there was there's the Trump moment, right, when you decide. Uh, are you going to go with the party or are you going to defend what conservatives traditionally stood? Do, do you believe in values? Do you believe in character? Mike Gerson profoundly believed in character. I don't have to sell that argument to you because a man of ill character took over the Republican Party in the form of Donald Trump. And Mike Gerson walked out and didn't just walk out. Mike Gerson wrote more articles, more opinion articles against Donald Trump than probably I did mm. being coming from the left side of the spectrum. Um, he, Mike made it a, a cause of his to redeem, to rescue conservatism from Trump and from Trumpists. And uh, on race, an issue where there are caricatures of conservatives, um, that they, they're just, they believe in white nationalism and white supremacy. Mike Gerson has been was one of the strongest voices for um, racial reconciliation, for honesty about America's history of racism, for about current racism, um, and about you know a racial caste system in much of this country. So uh, I, I give him full credit for falsifying those caricatures of religious conservatives and for being a man of integrity. And anyone who dealt with him, uh, that just that that wafted off of him. You could feel it. 
there's not, I mean, what's the phrase that, that Christians use? Witness. He was just a tremendous witness for the values that he not only claimed to believe in, but did believe in and lived every day. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I was telling uh, Pete and John that when I first started the program, I wrote this like dream list of, of guests uh, and uh, Michael Gerson and Tim Keller were bo both on there. Um, so last question and some business and we'll wrap up. Do you have any questions for me? I, I'm kind of curious about what you have learned since you, you and I and those of us in the we're all struggling to find an audience of people who are not rabidly, you know, left, right, uh, not ideologues, uh, who, who believe in, you know, sort of sanity, who believe in sanity and value. And I'm curious about what you have found, because I just think of you as a an, another another person who's trying to build an audience of of what, what my colleague. Sarah Longwell calls normies. <laughs> yeah, normal people. Yeah. And like, can, have have you what what have you found that um, that brings this community together? That draws in people. What unites them? What and I mean, what can we do? Basically, how can we build this? Yeah. So there are a few things. Number one is just providing a place for folks to go because there's so many people who they say, oh, I just can't talk about politics anymore. In my case, politics and religion. I, I just choose not to talk about it, whether it's at your Thanksgiving dinner with family and friends uh, or at your church, po talk of politics with people you go to church or synagogue or, you know, uh, or on the soccer field with your neighbors. Hey, we could talk about the soccer game and, you know, the work that they're doing on, you know, the freeway near us, but you can't talk about politics. I say, no, 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 no. There are some folks indeed that I get to a point where I say, you know what, we really can't talk about this. This, no matter how, I, I'm just not skilled enough uh, and, and have too many proclivities that I, I'm not a, I'm not as much of a saint as Michael Gerson was. I'm not able to get there with you. So I just have to set a boundary for myself, for my own mental health, for my own sanity, um, that, that there are indeed some folks. So I can't win them all, right? But I think a vast majority of people really do want to talk about these important topics, but they have been, they self silence uh, because they're afraid of saying, you know, I, I live in Southern California. So with the writer strike and now the actor strike, there's a lot of folks who don't fully agree with not necessarily with every issue. There are some issues that it makes perfect sense, but the, the fact that they're striking, you know, in my case, I believe in the writers and the actors unions, their fundamental right to collectively bargain. And there are some issues like trying to quantify um, residuals in this new landscape with with uh, streaming services. And, uh, you know, but there are some other issues that I really disagree with. But I find myself self censoring because I know what the cost is. So. The, the, the deal is the existence of the bulwark is a huge step in the right direction. The existence, you mentioned the dispatch, the existence of some of these platforms is, is huge. It gives me time in my car where I'm not, I'm not hitting the political crack pipe of Sean Hannity and pissing <laughs> myself off and ruining the rest of my day. You know, it gives me some sanity to listen to, to plug into thoughtful, nuanced debate. You and Charlie, your Mondays come obviously come from somewhat different perspectives. And sometimes you surprise me because he ends up a little bit to the left on a particular issue and you end up a little bit to the right on it. And it's, that's wonderful. Uh, for So just having the existence of that. And then here's, here's a key to it is that when folks are encouraged and welcomed into these conversations and given a place to be heard as individuals, as human beings, that's a step in the right direction, as opposed to even folks that we know, friends that we have, we find ourselves in these conversations and automatically we have the talking points of a Sean Hannity. We have the talking points of a Mark Levin. We have the talking points of a, a Rachel, Ma I don't want to compare Rachel Matt because she, she's, um, she's, she's a more investigative, thoughtful journalist, even though I disagree probably with a lot of her positions, but, but you, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, maybe the Midas touch or I, I don't know. I'm, I, I, there's not too many folks on the left that I think are as 
hyperbolic or enter into things in, in as much bad faith as, as some of the entities that, that dominate conservative media. But, you know, we come into these conversations with people we know and love. We know these human beings, and yet we start to fire those bullet points at them. So if we can remember that they're human beings and, and we had a conversation with a buddy that I graduated high school with. Um, he won't call himself a Trump supporter anymore or a MAGA guy, but he, he kind of is. <laughs> so, um, he says he 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 says uh, he's supporting DeSantis more because I think he is listening to um, and open to evolving his positions. But at the end of the day, he's been on the Trump train. He's a MAGA guy, red hat wearing. But, you know, we had this really great conversation. A lot of the conversation was just about his life. And, and it was about how he arrived at those positions and why he's held on to a lot of those positions. And, I, and, you know, listen, we got to the end of an hour, hour and a half, and we still disagreed on just about everything. But he said something really interesting. He said, uh, he said, um, thanks for the respect, Cor. He's from Jersey. Hey, Cor, thanks for the respect, man. Um, and uh, he goes, I, I, I was glad you, I was glad you listened to me. You know, so I, I think just, I think my buddy John just felt like it, just having somebody who heard him and saw him as a human being. And ask that key question that the braver angels really encourage folks to ask, which is, what is it in your life experience that led you to this point, that that brought you to um, having this position? Then it opens up a human being. It opens up a story. Uh, so I guess that's more <laughs> – that's a longer answer to your question than maybe you bargained for. But those are just some of my observations. No, that's that's super interesting, Corey, because what, what, it, what it makes me think is what we need is more – accidents we need more you know like so for example i grew up in in laporte texas a town east of houston right and it's a more conservative environment than the one i live in now in in maryland um and so when you know when when i watch pete Buttigieg, i'm like oh i totally relate to this guy i know what it's like to sort of be in a conservative area and you you have to learn to connect with people who are more conservative than you culturally because that's who you live with Right. But that's an accident. That's where you're born. Right. Here. I'm in Indiana. I'm in Texas, whatever. Um, it, what the problem we have now is so much of the world is sorted and we're living online where we can. The algorithm is saying, oh, you're a liberal here. Let me give you Joy Reid. Let me give you, you know, uh, Jen Psaki. Let me give you what here, here's the people you want to be. Al Sharpton. Here's here are the people you want to be paying attention to as opposed to who's your friend? Uh, my friend is a Trump supporter. Why? Because I've known this guy for a really long time. It's like we didn't choose each other based on our politics or whatever. We just, you know, and uh, that's how you know the whole person. You are, uh, you play basketball. I play basketball with some guys, right? I'm at the mercy of whatever they believe because I didn't choose them for their politics, right? We're, we, we do other activities together. Then we might have a conversation and it's, that we have some basis about knowing each other that isn't that right. It's so I like your idea of the whole the whole person, and I'm and I worry that we mustn't let society become so sorted by the algorithms and so dominated by politics as the criterion that sorts us that we lose touch with the people who disagree with us about politics or religion, but who we share something else with, you know, nice jump shot. That was really awesome. Yeah. You know, like I, I love your defense, <laughs> something else that you have in common. Right. Right. Yeah, no. And, and we have to break those algorithms by seeking out folks who may be of a different political stripe than we are. Uh, it happens naturally for me. I live in California 27, which is a very purple district. Uh, so folks that I interact with from my church tend to be one way. Folks that I interact with in the entertainment industry tend to be another way. So I get to have these conversations with people of different political, philosophical, social uh, stripes. And it, 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 I'm not great at it. That's why I'm doing this. Like uh, some folks are under the assumption that I do this program because I'm really good at it. I want to espouse how to do it. I'm doing the program so that I can learn how to do it better. I continue to fall all over myself. So before we um, before we take off, how can we follow you, the bulwark, and all the great work that you and the team are doing? Uh, well, so the the site is just thebulwark.com, um, and uh, we invite everyone to to read. If you want to join us as a subscriber, uh, we love that. It helps to support the journalism that we do, and we are trying to build a community of people who are sane in the middle, um, as as others are. Um, so I hope people will join Bulwark Plus. It's a, it's a 
it's a subscription subscription that helps to support our work. Um, you, and I'm on, I used to say I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter at just at Salatan, S-A-L-E-T-A-N. I'm now on threads, which is, I have W Salatan, just the W in front of that. Uh, and, um, you know, subs, where, where else? I mean, the social media is fragmented. I'm on Substack under just my name, Will Salatan, um, and post. Um, so all of that stuff, but I really do hope the, this article about Lindsey Graham, which is actually, they call it a book is available at the bulwark. Um, if you just type in the corruption of Lindsey Graham, it will show up for you. It's a hundred page book. You can read it. Nobody, I don't read a hundred page book. You can read it as a series of articles, the way it was originally written. Um, very digestible and better yet we're you know the audio version is coming out now we've just dropped the third of seven installments so for normal people who don't have time to read a lot you're commuting or whatever you can look up the corruption of lindsey graham and find the audio and you can watch you can listen to that as a series of seven installments and i really do hope people will do that because I wrote this series to try to understand what happened to us in the Trump years and is still going on today and how people can become aware and arm themselves against a return of what I argue is a kind of American authoritarianism. And that is, I think, the danger we face today. Yeah, it's a great read. I'll have all of those links in the show notes. And uh, I just really, it's its really great hanging out with you. I, it's, it's so nice to see you. And uh, I, I really appreciate you doing this. Corey, thank you so much. I really enjoy talking with you. Um, it's a, it really is like, it's fresh air, man. I just feel like um, I'm inhaling carbon monoxide all the time. And then talking to you is like, you know, hiking the mountains and in, in, inhaling beautiful oxygen. Thank you so much. Oh, that's encouraging. I appreciate that. And as always, if you dig what we're doing here, please hit that subscribe button or follow button. Or like I said earlier, if you can take the time to leave a review and comments, it really does help. And give me a shout online. I'm on all the socials, even threads, because uh, I'm, I'm cool like that. I'm at Corey S. Nathan. That's Corey with an E, S as in Sam, at Corey S. Nathan. Now go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week. 